Um, this is brought to you by, uh, in part by our sponsors from Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, um, and Martha's Vineyard Savings. And we want to let you know that uh, all books that uh, are part of this series are available at Eight Cousins and Falmouths. We hope you spend some time uh, soliciting them. Um, a reminder that it's a, it's a it's a busy week. I want to make sure you, you kick off your fall uh, in, in the right way. We've got a talk tonight, a talk tomorrow, a talk on Saturday afternoon. So um, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I keep you guys out of trouble. Um, um, our guest tonight is yet another person that was really looking forward to coming to Falmouth. Um, uh, but uh, as we know, uh, the, the pandemic is precluding that. So we're doing it by Zoom. And She's uh, not unfamiliar with Massachusetts, having grown up in Marblehead, so this would have been a way for her to get home, kind of. Um, so I'll let her explain. But she's also written more than one book. And as I was talking with her before, I always kind of uh, leaves me daunted when people write about physicists, for one thing. But she also uh, wrote books along with her husband on uh, child psychology and psychiatry. So um, um, this is. I'm 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 daunted to say the least. But uh, if you would, would you uh, would you welcome our guest tonight, Nancy Greenspan? Thank you very much, Mark. I wish I were there with you. I really was looking forward to traveling up that way. I I love Massachusetts, and uh, my roots are there. So another time, I will get up there. Um, I want to start by just giving a little recap about Klaus Fuchs and then going into a, a tiny bit more detail to give you a sense of his life. And uh, so I want to start by summing up with the fact that he was a man of mystery and complexity. He was a German by birth, a, a, uh, a British by naturalization, and a communist by conviction. As a teenager in the 1920s, he was totally apolitical. Um, his passion was mathematics. He, by, the 19, by 1933, he was a firebrand, 21 years old, whom the Nazis hated and tried to kill. By 1945, uh, he had aided three countries in creating an atomic bomb, the US, the US, the UK, and the USSR. He had many twists and turns in his life. Many accounts mythologize Fuchs as an isolated, reserved, lonely, frail person. This characterization has skewed our impression of him somewhat. One piece of this is very true. He was very reserved. But that is not what defined him. What defined him was his steely determination um, for social, economic, and political equality. He lived in a chaotic world. If he had lived in a different one, he probably would have been an esteemed mathematics professor in a renowned German university, um, a scholar, non-political, reserved, but life was not so. Uh, instead, in the 1950s, uh, he became sufficiently infamous that even today, someone asked me when I was speaking to them, was he evil? How do we consider a person who risked his life to fight the Nazis and then spied against his adopted country? Maybe the real question is, how does one weigh moral accountability? Fuchs left very little behind about himself. I located a half a dozen different archives that filled in some gaps. Uh, some files at the University of Kiel, where he was a student, uh, were simply labeled as miscellaneous disciplinary matters. There was, on the label, there was no connection to Fuchs. And I think I was the first person to look at these files in 85 years. It was hundreds of pages. And it basically laid out the drama of his early life fighting the Nazis. 
these documents and others uh, capture uh, the obscured moments in the 1930s and 40s that people don't know a lot about. They give more nuanced account of his life as well as an appreciation of the world that was unraveling around him. His story takes us to a different but somewhat familiar uh, place. Swept into Fuchs's story are internal national struggles, conflicts over immigration and race, establishment of internment camps, dysfunctional legislatures, street protests, paramilitary troops, Russian spying, and nuclear weapons. I cover all these in the book extensively with a lot of history as background to his life, and I'll just touch on a few of them here. So let me start, let me do my screen share here. Um, and here we have six month old Klaus. He was born on December 29th, 1911 in a small town south of Frankfurt named Rüsselsheim. He was the third of four children whose early years were formed by the devastation of World War I. There was the, um, after that, there was the, the Allies blockade and starvation. There, that was in 1918 to 1919 when the Versailles Treaty came along with its onerous conditions on Germany. Uh, there was the ex exorbitant inflation. And then they recovered from that and it was the, Great Depression and severe unemployment. Here's little Klaus in his army uniform with his brother Gerhard, and they have dug trenches. You can see the soldiers that are in the trenches. That's what they did during the war. Emil Fuchs, the father, was a, a liberal minister in a very conservative Lutheran church. Early on, he championed the rights of the working class and from the pulpit, uh, op-eds in the paper, letters, he argued for their rights and he condemned the, uh, the right-wing militia that were arising during the 1920s, which often made him very unpopular. He was a socialist, he was not a communist. His views and personality had a profound effect on Klaus and his siblings, all who became socialists. Uh, very quickly. Uh, Fuchs and he were opposite in temperament. Uh, Fuchs was as reserved as Emil was um, outspoken. But they had the same steely, unbending core. As a teenager, though, Klaus espoused no political opinions. He was a scholar in the family. He was famous in the area for his mathematical gifts and he won uh, the, the Weimar Republic Prize. They gave one year, they gave a special prize to the best student in the area, and he won that. Here he is with his family. His mother is in the middle. In 1930, he registered at the University of Leipzig in, in mathematics. In the early 1930s, the Weimar Republic was as unstable politically as it was economically. Uh, President Hindenburg ruled basically by executive decree because the parliament, the Reichstag, was stalemated. Uh, they were unable to create a ruling majority, even though there were frequent elections to try to solve that problem. And it was largely because the socialists and the communists had a long-standing hatred of each other and they wouldn't work together, even though they were very prominent parties. So in the, in the presidential election of 1932, Hindenburg was running for a second term and the socialists decided to support him because they didn't want to split the vote. They didn't want the other, an, the other prominent candidate who was running to be able to, to get in and that other candidate was Adolf Hitler. This was a key turning point in Klaus's life. Every day for two years, Klaus and his older brother Gerhardt had fought the policies of Hindenburg. Uh, Gerhardt was uh, a student, a law student at the University of Leipzig when Klaus arrived. 
He was a member of the, and very active in the social student party there. And causes one of his first acts politically was to join this party. He was soon fighting Nazis in the streets. And he later said that he learned more in the streets than he did in the classroom. After his first year in Leipzig, they both moved to the University of Kiel. And in the late 1920s, the Nazis had gotten a grip, a firm grip into the universities throughout Germany, Kiel being no exception. When they arrived, Klaus and Gerhard uh, registered its, uh, with the Socialist Party and seeing the lay of the land, decided that they had to form their own student leftist group in order to counter the Nazi students. Gerhard was as outspoken as his father. So he became the leader of the group and um, Klaus was the political organizer, but he was still very much under uh, Gerhardt's influence. He'd only been involved in all of this for one year. Here is the student group there, part of them in their little group. So in Kiel, unable to, to, to support Hindenburg, the, the two of them started to support the communist candidate. When they did that, the socialists kicked them out of their party and the communists asked them to, to come in and be members. They hesitated. They weren't sure, but they, they wanted to do something politically to fight the Nazis. And so they decided to become communists and they never turned back. Um, at that point, it was, um, there were starting to be mobs in the streets. There was a shooting here and there. Uh, there were finally riots and stormtroopers coming in. That was all evolving as they were at this point. Klaus's hatred for the Nazis increased and vice versa until the Nazi a secret student council of the Nazis sentenced him to death. All of this happened in early February of 1933, soon after Hindenburg had appointed Adolf Hitler as chancellor. And when that happened, everyone, all the Nazis in the country were emboldened, including the students in Kiel. On one day, a, a, a riot erupted at the university. The stormtroopers rushed in, they beat up Klaus, and the Nazi students yelled, throw him in the fjord. Police were there, they stood by and literally watched. They did nothing. How Fuchs survived the frigid February inlet, which was uh, from the Baltic Sea, is a mystery. He simply said later that he swam out. He could not have been very long in there, he would have died. A few weeks later, by coincidence, he was on a train to uh, Berlin. It was the same night as the uh, Reichstag had burned, which he learned about in the newspapers as he was sitting on the train. And he knew when he were, arrived, he was in jeopardy. And so he immediately joined the underground network of young resistors. At that time, the average lifespan of a resistor, and these were mostly 19, 20-year-old college students, they were young kids, uh, they would survive for about three months before the Gestapo would grab them and torture them. Many lost their heads there. They had a guillotine. Um, by July of 1933, the Gestapo were closing in on Klaus. The uh, Berlin, uh, the Kiel Gestapo had told those in Berlin that Klaus was the number one student on their list and they wanted him. So uh, Klaus found this out through his network and he fled to Paris and then crossed the channel and ended up at the University of Bristol in September of 1933. He was 21 years old. His university years in Bristol gained him a BA and a PhD in physics. There wasn't a math concentration at the, that time there. And then he received a postdoctoral fellowship to the University of Edinburgh in 1937. 
throughout this time, he was not quiet about his communist ideology, which had evolved over time. It didn't start there, but he, you know, he started studying it and all. But what he did keep quiet was the fact that he was in contact with friends in London. These friends are also German young emigres, young resistors who had found their way to London, and they were helping the resistors back who were still in, in Berlin. They were printing up propaganda sheets and shipping them over, and, and Klaus was part of that uh, whole body. Throughout this period, his hatred of the Nazis was increasing because he was finding out information about what was happening to his family in Berlin. His brother by this time had escaped to Prague, but there he contracted a TB. He was extremely ill and in a sanatorium in Prague. His older sister Elizabeth, here with her four-year-old son, committed suicide by uh, jumping off a train. Their mother had committed suicide a few years earlier. His younger sister had left. She was able to get out safely. She had a visa to the US and she went to study at Swarthmore College. So she was safe. By 1939, the only person in uh, Berlin was Klaus's 67 year old father, Emil. And he was caring for his four year old grandson. And he did so throughout the war, keeping them both alive, amazingly. Uh, in 1939, September, World War II started. It, it was the phony war. Uh, by the spring of 1940, the real war had started. And at this point, uh, the British government uh, worried that the refugees, who they knew were mostly Jewish, uh, would be a fifth column and aid a German invasion. So it ordered many of the refugees to be rounded up and interned. Excusing this absurdity, uh, one cabinet member said in a secret meeting, once a German, always a German. So on May 12th of 1940, Klaus was, round, was one of the first to be rounded up of 30,000 eventually who ended up in camps. Uh, he and the others were rounded or were herded into camps uh, surrounded by barbed wire. You can see here, this is one of his first camps. Uh, armed guards, there was little food. There were no newspapers, no radios, no mail. They had no idea what was going on in the outside world with the war. It was cram space and they had intermingled Nazi POWs who taunted them. Uh, they had isolation, starvation, in, and sadistic guards who did nothing to try to keep the two, the two sides separate. And, but the Nazis being POWs got kind of special treatment. One internee there described them all as, quote, caged animals. On July 3rd, the government shipped him and, and a thousand other uh, young men to Canada. As he was about to leave, Fuchs wrote a letter to his mentor in Edinburgh, Max Born, and he said, quote, I find it hard to cut away from a country which I have learned to love. The 10-day trip across the ocean to Quebec was horrific. The internees lived through starvation and bouts of severe vomiting and diarrhea with no access to a bathroom at night. It, no one uh, escaped the stench and the filth and the squalor that it was a horrible trip. They arrived in Canada. They, uh, at first they stood on the deck of the ship for 10 hours. They didn't receive any even water until 4 p.m. They received no food. Uh, and finally at 7 p.m. they were able to disembark and they were taken up in buses to the Plains of Abraham and put into Camp L, which again with guards and barbed wire. There were cliques that formed in the camp. Um, the head of the communist clique was a very charismatic person by the name of Hans Koller. He had been a friend of Hemingway's during the Spanish Civil War. You can see them here in this photo. And Fuchs became his deputy. 
it was very much like the relationship that he had had with his brother, I think, in, in Kiel and Berlin, and was very comfortable to Klaus. Collar and Klaus skillfully created a broader refugee committee. And so when the Canadian government decided to, that they had to uh, split up Camp L for a number of reasons. One was to create, they decided they would do it in order to create a kosher camp for Orthodox Jews. And Klaus then had, because of this refugee committee, had the influence to manipulate the numbers to make sure that the non-Jewish communists, of which there were you now only about 60, went to this kosher camp as well. It was supposed to be just Jews. That particular non-communist group, they feared that if they went into another kind of camp where there were Nazi POWs, they probably wouldn't survive the brutality that would be inflicted on them from the, the Nazis. There wasn't that much control in the camps. So, um, Fuchs, this was only for an, a number of months. Uh, Fuchs was released from internment and was back in England in January of 1941. He went back to Edinburgh, and from there he received an offer to work on the British Atomic Bomb Project at the University of Edinburgh. Once in, in Birmingham, he had regular uh, communication with the, the communists that he had been in the camp with. They were, many of them were in Birmingham. It was at working a very big industrial center. And he, he also saw uh, Hans Kahler. He kept up with him, who it turned out was a Russian agent for the, he was recruiting agent for the, uh, the military, Russian military intelligence. I don't think Klaus knew that in the camps, but he certainly knew it later on. So not surprisingly, in August of 1941, Fuchs went to London, met a Russian agent, and took the step into espionage that sealed his fate. Internal loan did not create Klaus Fuchs a spy, but it did reawaken Klaus Fuchs, the resistor and the communist. It was a renewed and, and strong voice that he got there. He continued to spy and in December of 1943, he sailed to New York City with a British scientific team to work on the Manhattan Project. There he had a new handler who he met fleetingly throughout the city. And then in July of 1944, he was Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't do that. I, that's what the kosher camp looked like. Um, he, he was transferred to um, Los Alamos in July of 44. There he was responsible for the theoretical work on the lenses for the plutonium bomb. He, there was a problem with it, which he create, corrected in order for the chain reaction to be efficient and work. There were many key pieces to make the plutonium bomb work. It wasn't a very straightforward um, bomb and his was one of the keys to its success. It was not the only one but it was a big one. On July 2nd of 1945 he drove to, to the guard gate at Los Alamos got out of his car, the guards um, checked his car, he got back in, he drove down to Santa Fe. And there he met his handler from New York and handed him the, bomb, the plans for the plutonium bomb. When he was being checked out at the, at, by the guards in Los Alamos, the plans for the bomb were in his jacket pocket. A month later, uh, the Trinity test of the plutonium bomb uh, was a success in Alamogordo. Then came Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, that was just basically 75 years ago last month. Uh, US and UK scientists foresaw an arms race. And to thwart it, they urged the two governments to share information on the bomb with the Russians 
and to institute a very rigid inspection program that this would have some effect on not having runaway um, arms race. The governments basically said no. So uh, Fuchs returned to England in the summer of 1946, and there he was appointed head of theoretical research at the British facility. It was a new top secret facility on um, uh, uh, nuclear, on the atomic, on atomic energy, and um, it was near Oxford. It was a very interesting place. Uh, they still had rationing at that time, so much of their activities occurred there. As you can see, here was a very typical, uh, it happens to be folks and his friends, a very typical uh, picnic, and they would have parties, and, and they were a very busy place. And he worked there for three years being this director. But then another life-changing event occurred. In August of 1945, US and UK uh, codebreakers in Arlington, Virginia, which is just close to where I live, deciphered some early 1940s Russian messages. It was a project called Venona. And um, these messages contained evidence that there had been a spy in the Manhattan Project. It was, it's quite amazing to watch how they uh, uncovered all of this, but within a few weeks, they uh, had fingered, they, MI5 and FBI, had uh, fingered Klaus as a likely suspect for this. And without these messages, he probably never would have been discovered. So it became a cat and get mouse game between Fuchs and MI5. It began with MI5 following his every move, listening to his phone calls, bugging his office and his house. They needed to catch him handing over material because they couldn't use these Venona, uh, the Venona information in court. It, it was top secret. They didn't want the Russians to, to know about what they had done. So they had to, they had to catch him, but he had stopped spying. There's a mystery around this, his decision to do this. Before MI5 and uh, FBI had any inkling that there was a spy, Klaus knew that he was in a position that he, where he may be found out. It's not clear how, at least to me or anybody else who has looked at this, when MI5 began, began to tail him around England, he quickly spotted them. He was watching for this. So in effect, he was really the cat, not the mouse in this game. When the surveillance failed, uh, MI5 decided they would interview him and try to get him to confess. And they used their top interviewer here, who's shown Jim Scarden. Uh, he was unsuccessful. But surprisingly, at the end of January 1950, on his own, Klaus confessed. He did it because he, he struggled with having betrayed his friends and their friendship. And he knew if he didn't confess, they, he, MI5 would look to someone else to be a suspect because clearly there was a spy and it, they knew it was somebody who was British. So he couldn't let this happen to his friends and so he confessed. He, he had a breakdown and he just uh, told them. Throughout all of this um, drama, the British and the Americans had a very somber backdrop. At the same time they started looking for Klaus in August of 49, the Russians detonated a plutonium bomb. Fuchs's information had, in, had sped up their timeline by a year or two, and um, no scientists in the UK or the US doubted that the Russians weren't up to creating their own bomb. They had not expected it to be so soon, and they were quite stunned by this. So it made sense when they found out that Klaus had been spying. Um,
A month after he was arrested, uh, they had a trial in the Old Bailey. It lasted for 88 minutes and was a media sensation. The judge gave him the maximum sentence, which was 14 years for espionage. Uh, Fuchs was shocked. He had been told he would get a light sentence and because he cooperated fully with them. He could have appealed because there were some irregularities in the interview process. He chose not to. He rationalized that he had done this. He deserved the punishment. He would take what he was given. While he was in prison, he continued to cooperate and answer MI5's questions. They weren't quite sure he was going to do that, but he did. They were most interested in the handlers that he had. Um, and he did give them some information, but often by the time he, quote, remembered these details, the person had already left, so he, they didn't catch anyone. Um, at that point, two people he didn't give up was his last agent in, in London and his agent in the US. He did give them a vague description of the person in the US the, uh, to the FBI. Uh, Hoover was being pushed tremendously to find this person. Congress was saying to him, why didn't the FBI discover the spying? And Hoover wasn't one to take that easily. He, he blamed MI5 and he had reason to do so. Since 1934, Fuchs's um, security clearance files showed evidence of his communist activities in, in Germany. But they didn't, they cleared him up through about a half dozen security checks. They didn't have any reason to suspect that he was still spying. There were a number of people with his background and they needed their scientific abilities. MI5 never told the Americans anything about this. It assured the FBI they had done rigorous security clearances on all the British scientists that come to the US. At the same time, the MI5 told a British security officer not to let the Americans know about this background. So, you know, there, there was reason for Hoover to be upset. Fuchs ended up in several Victorian era prisons. He was always held in high esteem by the other inmates. He listened to their problems, he gave them cigarettes, he taught them, he created courses in math and physics some of which with the, this, the, this background, those who were let out of prison were able to find better jobs. They wrote to him and told him this. When, um, he was paroled after nine years for good behavior. The British wanted him to stay there and work with them some more. Uh, there were still friendly relationships <laughs> between everybody. Uh, he refused. He decided he wanted to go back to East Berlin. And so on June 23rd of 1959, he claimed, climbed on a Polish airliner and flew back to East Germany. He landed in, 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 East, in an East Berlin airport. There was no hero's welcome. He was met by his now grown up nephew, Klaus, who was raised by Emil Fuchs. He uh, also by another uh, German official. Uh, there were hordes of journalists around, as there had been in London, but a limousine picked this group up and um, drove them to Emil's uh, co summer cottage. It turned out that the limousine driver was a Stasi agent. They didn't know that at that time. By September, Klaus was the uh, deputy director of the East German Nuclear Research uh, Institute in Dresden. He had a nice apartment in the city. He had a, a very nice weekend um, house just outside the city. And he had married Greta Carlson, a woman he had met in Paris in 1933, and the uh, government official who had met him at the airport in, in, in East Berlin. And here are the three uh, folks, um, generations and uh, Klaus with his wife, Greta. The Russians wanted him to work with them on nuclear arms research in their facility in Dubna. He refused. He, 
as far back as Harwell, he had been interested in creating a very special type of commercial reactor. So when he arrived in Dresden, he can, wanted to continue this work and use these kind of reactors to power um, the East German economy. Initially, the East German government had given him permission. He thought he could do this. But after just a few years, they abandoned him and abandoned the research and he was devastated. This was the only thing he wanted to do in his life. And in fact, in later years, he called for nuclear disarmament. Uh, he, he, here's the man who had been key in creating bombs for three countries. He had become a peacenik, or um, perhaps he'd always been that way. His father, the Lutheran minister, at the same time was a Quaker. <laughs> it was a very confused family in how they aligned themselves. His short-term goal when he started working on the bomb was to create a bomb ahead of the Nazis. He was very sincere and worked tirelessly for the Allies to do that. But then he wanted to protect Russia against what he would consider the capitalist imperial a threat of nuclear blackmail, so then he had to spy. He maintained his goal in spying was to create a nuclear balance and obviate the, verb, the bomb's further use. Klaus Fuchs died in 1988 at the age of 76 of lung cancer. He was buried in a Berlin cemetery for noted communists, and he had a very nice formal funeral with a procession and a string quartet. The Russians had never admitted to his helping them. This was the first time that they showed any recognition of him and they sent a very lovely wreath and a, a representative for them. He was a young KGB agent from Dresden and his name was Vladimir Putin. The significance of uh, Fuchs's spying for military purposes is unclear. The Russians advance in schedulement that they had a, a nuclear bomb at the time the Korean War started. There were many factors involved in Truman's not dropping a bomb, which most people consider a, the right thing to have done was a benefit. Um, but certainly the Russians having a bomb was one of those how important it was is still debated. The political downside though is um, indisputable. The uh, American uh, Anglo nuclear cooperation basically stopped. Americans succumbed to the Red Scare hysteria of Joseph McCarthy. Uh, civil liberties suffered and the Cold War heated up. So Fuchs, the quiet, serious student of mathematics. He faced perils, he took life-threatening risks, and he made grave choices. How do we judge him? The question of moral accountability is not new. It is still with us and as difficult to resolve today. Now we debate the standing of some of the most significant founders of our country. In our own chaotic world, ambiguity prevails. If a deeper understanding of these issues, many of which still afflict us, um, interests you, please consider reading Atomic Spy and telling your friends. If you go to atomicspythebook.com, you can watch some interesting uh, videos of the times I bought some clips of, of things that went on and one of them actually has Klaus in it. So I, I welcome you to do that. I thank you for being here and I've enjoyed seeing you all and thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. That was outstanding. Um, um, as, and by the way, if you've got any questions, uh, like like we always do, down on the on the bottom, um, we use the chat feature and, and type in your questions. Um, you touched on the first question I had as I was listening to you right towards the end, and 
when you when you talked about um, the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, and how he blamed MI5, because I'm, as I'm listening to you, obviously this is the height of the Cold War, 1950. You know, the beginning, very beginnings of it. Yeah, beginning. And and um, it's like he wasn't he he never hid the fact he was a socialist slash communist. So how did he somehow slip through? How, how did this not get through? But evidently, MI5 was cognizant of this and chose not to tell anyone. Is that... Is, is, that is true. MI5 knew that he'd been a communist in Germany. When he came to England, he was a little bit in Bristol, uh, involved in uh, the Spanish Civil War, um, had the committee, but a, a lot of people were doing that. There was... Uh, another organization that where people were friends with Russia and England, and this was the uh, Virginia Woolf and the whole um, Bloomsbury group, and there were thousands of people. Communism was a very different thing then in the 30s with unemployment and the Depression than it became in the, in the Cold War in the late 40s and, and early 50s and on. So they knew he had these he had been a communist, but he was completely uh, non-political in England. The chief constables were asked, you know, um, you know, is there any problems with him? They had no inkling that he was doing anything. And he wasn't actually in the 30s. He, he had those, his friends in um, London, but that wasn't spying or anything. He was just trying to help the, the, rep, the resistors. So when they had to clear him, they looked at his record, and, and the, the other thing that's important is that the Nazis would take socialists, Jews, uh, Marxists, and just put them all together. It didn't matter. They would call you a Marxist or a communist, and it didn't matter how, if, even if you were a social democrat, such as what we have in S Sweden now, which we have in Germany now, that you would be labeled that way. So they didn't take that label um, that seriously. The other piece of it is in the 30s and 40s, they desperately needed scientists. They had the Germans on their doorstep. They had to figure out radar. They had, they discovered in the 1941 that there was a possibility of making a bomb and they had to make sure they got there before the Germans. All these scientists knew each other, especially the refugee scientists. Uh, Klaus's teacher in Leipzig was Werner Heisenberg. Um, they had all worked together. So they knew which others were capable of and they needed to be protective of themselves. And their goal was to beat the Germans at that point and to stave off any kind of invasion there was. So they were willing to excuse loads of people who had the same profile as Klaus. None of the others were spies. Um, it just turned out that him. So that's why they did it. But they were sensitive enough to it all that they they didn't want the um, Americans to know this because they the HUAC was you know well it it actually there had always been more of an issue about communism in the U.S. than there had been in Britain. You know, and, and you're right. There was kind of a almost a she she thing in the 20s and 30s where people would be. Yeah, it was a very different atmosphere. And that yeah. was, HUAC or its uh, other committees that were his namesake and uh, uh, procedures had always been there, and 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 there was just more of an attitude in, but not as much as in the 50s. Is it is it safer the to just made a different opinion on you know impact on people? Is it almost safer it to was. yeah? Is it almost safer to to um, label him as an anti-Nazi as opposed to a staunch communist, or did he become? He was when he first joined. That's exactly why he joined the Nazi the, the Communist Party. The communists were really the only group. That, the Social Democrats weren't f fighting the communists very much. The young kids were because young kids, no matter what their label, were willing to fight and risk their life for anything. So um, he was anti-Nazi, but once he got into it, just the way his father had been with the working class and all, it, it was an ideal, he was an ideologue. And so he did start studying and he did become more convinced. And he had people around him who helped that to happen. 
And it was an easy step for him to make, which he did do in England. And, and he, he saw that the, once he kind of had that idea of affinity for the Russian system, he, the, the Brits in the late 30s, when the Nazis were terribly against the Nazis, there were many people in the upper class, including the person who became king, who were very cl close. And they were, you know, the king and, and um, he had relatives that went over and visited and, and to the Nazis. They, MI5 went over and talked to the not the you know the people in um, the Nazi Party in, in the thirties to find out what was going on. So there was a close connection. It was in the newspaper, and Klaus would see that and say, you know, what he saw, and he wasn't that wrong. Uh, he saw that what the British wanted to do was have the Germans and Russians fight each other and wipe each other out. And if the Germans won and the British weren't involved, so much the better. They were quite happy with that. And he saw that it was all over the newspapers. And that certainly was something, at this point he wasn't spying when he saw it, it was 1939. He didn't have anything to hand anybody, but that was in him um, as, as towards the government, not towards the people and what they had done for him, but it was towards the British government. He, he felt an anger that they weren't helping the, the Russians more. The Russians, when the Germans did finally attack them, uh, were pleading for help because they felt they were going to lose. I mean, it was terrible. And they lost millions of people in those battles. It was an awful situation. So everybody knew that, including Klaus. Robert Oppenheim also felt that science knows no boundaries, that the, it, it's not about nationalism, it's about science, it's all universal. Did Fuchs believe in that too? I mean, when he gave secrets, was it about science being shared or was it political? It was both. And in fact, many of the scientists at Los Alamos had that feeling. Um, Niels Bohr, um, Denmark, Nobel Prize winner, uh, he felt very strongly about this and went and lobbied Roosevelt and Churchill to get information, uh, you know, atomic information to be shared with the Russians. They, they had a very strong feeling about this, the, the scientists, not all of them, Edward Teller certainly didn't agree with that, but um, and Oppenheimer would have been one of those, I actually don't know, I don't think, there were petitions on this uh, that from Los Alamos, from um, the whole British team signed a petition to their government saying, please give this information. You know, this is what science does. So th they did have a very strong feeling about that. And Klaus signed that petition. He did feel that way, but he also, for him, it was also, it was uh, just as equally political. He did not want the Russians to have be blackmailed by you do what we say or you're, we're going to bomb you, that kind of blackmail. And without their own bomb, that's what you know, could have happened. You started your talk by posing the question, is Klaus Fuchs evil? And then you said we got into a moral ambiguity thing. As you're researching this, as you're writing this, as you're learning more about him, did you come in with a preconceived notion? And if so, did it change? What, what was your ultimate takeaway? If, would you like this man if you met him? <laughs> he was very quiet and reserved and a lot of people felt put off by that, although he had some very, very close friends. I first, quote, met Klaus Fuchs when I was writing another biography. I wrote a biography of Max Born who he was with in Edinburgh. And when I did, I was reading um, the family letters and diaries and things like that of the Bournes. And they were talking about Klaus. He was part of their family to a large degree. Max Born always worked at home. Klaus would be there working with him, playing scat, the three-handed card game, being in a musical ensemble, having dinner with them. He would take the, the Bourne daughters to the movies. Um, and go on walks with him. He was a perfectly nice, decent person. And at that point also, he remind you, he was not spying either. He was just being a physicist and a, a, a graduate student. And 
And then when I, I learned that he was, you know, had been spying um, as, as I did my research and it came out, uh, I went to the archives and, and discovered that there was very little information about him at that point. So I had the born information and, and that was and, and just a few smatterings of other things. But my impression was he was this, what seemed to be a nice person who had spied. And my immediate reaction was, how could he do that? This was a country that had helped him. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't understand it. I then collected huge amounts of information from other places besides, and it turned out that the archives in London, MI5 declassified thousands of files. I mean, there's so much information there, not only on class folks, but everybody who was, you know, in the thirties and the forties who were physicists and doing all kinds of things. So um, I, I, I did discover uh, many sides of him from his family. I became uh, friends with Klaus, the, the nephew um, who his father had raised. Uh, he became a friend. There were nieces that, who live here in the US I became friends with. I got a lot of family information. I got uh, information from the um, memoirs of other you know, physicists who he'd worked with, all of whom had liked him. And many of them who could understand why he did this. The head of MI5, who, Dick White, who is head of MI5 and MI6, the only person who's done that, wrote on uh wrote down that he could understand why klaus did this he was an ideologue he took no money and he was helping an out uh, an ally of the of, of britain at the time he did it he britain was an ally up until through the war and a friendly nation up through the early 50s when he was doing this and he could completely understand it and there were a lot of people who had that feeling so that certainly influenced my attitude towards him. I think my, my final stance with him is he should not have done that. <laughs> um, and if, if you can, but on the other hand, there's never been another uh, bomb dropped either. So one argues whether the means can justify the ends. Um, you know, if, if that was the right way to do it, the right way was to share the information with the Russians in an open way. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's, a very, it's very hard. Uh, he should not have done it. He did it. it. It turned out that it wasn't such a big deal. I mean, it didn't really do much in the long run because the Russians were very good physicists and they would have gotten there on their own. That doesn't excuse the sin of, you know, the intent. So, but on the other hand, he fought the Nazis and he, he, he and his family helped a lot of Jews get out of Germany. You know, they, how do you put those two things together? I don't know. I'd be interested in other people's ideas. Um, the title of your book is Atomic Spy. It's probably it's always going to be the, the first thing people say about Klaus Fuchs. He was an atomic spy. But um, um, before I let you go, what, what would be his legacy in the physics world? What, how would physicists view his work? Not, not the, uh, the spying is separate, but his actual work in physics. He actually was a his real focus was mathematics, but, and because he spent most of his time on the bomb, um, it, that's, I mean, there, it, it wasn't, you know, you didn't, dis well, he made some discoveries in a way and he, but I think most, it's, it's interesting. Many physicists say, oh, you know, he was just a calculator. You gave him a mathematics problem or he's been, his biographers who weren't physicists wrote this. You give him a problem and he can calculate it in a second and he was just, you know, really good with numbers. But he was much more than that. And in a different time, he probably, he was considered one of the top nuclear physicists in the world. Um, people didn't see him as being terribly creative. 
but by the same token, he and John von Neumann, who was you know, an amazing mathematician, probably the best of the 20th century, um, put together a patent, uh, a secret patent on a very specific thing for the hydrogen bomb. And he, um, uh, folks later said he did most of this and it was very clever what they did. It didn't turn out to work, but there was a secret, there was a little piece in there that ended up being similar to what ended up in the hydrogen bomb. And he did, uh, he did an article when he was a student that had, was, was instrumental in helping the solid state physics um, arena go forward. It's, it's quoted still today by thousands of people, this article and what he discovered. So he, he, he was um, a very, very good physicist. He was better a mathematician in a sense, but he, and so he was applying the mathematics to it. He didn't come up out of it as a theoretical creative physicist. He had adapted to that. But I, my own personal opinion in talking to physicists, I'm not a physicist myself, but I, you know, this is my second book and my first book really, <laughs> I learned a lot. Um, I, think, I think he was a very, very good physicist. Would he have, some people say he might have won a Nobel Prize. I'm not sure he had that level of creativity. They're all very good physicists who don't win Nobel Prizes. So yes, that's a long, probably a long answer to your short question. No, it's all good. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, continued good luck with this book. I wish you were, you were able to come to the to the Cape in person. Um, you could have you could have visited Marblehead while you were home, but uh, but I, I'm glad you were able to join us via Zoom. Uh, 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 so thank you very much for doing this tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, the name of the book is Atomic Spy. Uh, again, good luck with this, and thank you for for being here tonight. And thank you for having me, Mark. I enjoyed it, and it's nice to meet you and everyone else. Oh, you, you too. Thank you so very, very much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.